welcome to our virtual studio visit with Durham Press in beautiful Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. This is the final program of Print Month held in conjunction with the IFPDA Fine Art Print Fair, which is online through Sunday, November 1st. You can get to the fair from the IFPDA website. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to thank all of our cultural partners for making our first online print month such a success. We have been joined by thousands of people from nearly 30 countries, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be a part of this wonderful group effort. Today for our final program, we have the pleasure of a visit to Durham Press with JP Russell and Marshall and a visit with the artist Emil Lucas and their team. Durham Press is known for their spectacular colorful collaborations with artists including Nicolene Thomas, Beatrice Milhaus, and Holly Applebaum. Today we'll get a look at the process behind recent projects with James Nairs and Jacob Hashimoto and as I said a visit with the artist Emil Lucas. We'll be taking questions throughout the program as we move through the studio. If you have a question please type it into the Q&A box. We are in rural Pennsylvania and the Wi-Fi can be glitchy as we move between spaces. If we freeze, please just stick with us and it'll come back. And if you're joining us from the US, please vote on Tuesday. With that, I'm happy to hand over the program to Ann Marshall, JP Russell, Emil Lucas, and the team at Durham Press. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome. Um, my name's Ann Marshall and this is my husband and partner, John Paul Russell, and we're really excited to have you all come visit us today at Durham Press. We got an absolutely beautiful day, so that's incredibly a great time this month with all the programming um, done by the IFPDA. And I wanna say a special thank you to Jenny and Sherry. It's been just a remarkable month of fascinating visits to my colleagues and friends, studios. Um, I was so excited to get to tour around different studios. Usually this time we'd be all together at the print fair. So what a wonderful way to switch it up and actually be able to spend time still together. So thank you, Jenny. And so, that's, so the way we're going to structure this today is we're going to just sort of pretend you've arrived to visit us, which we do welcome at any time. Um, we have group tours here and we have a uh, showroom in New York City as well. Building because the building's been very informative to what we've done here. Um, and JP will take over at that point and then we'll give you some short tours that we work with and the projects we make. We'll have a nice talk with Emil, who has been kind enough to come and visit with us, and he's going to talk about his monoprints. And then we'll finish up with some exciting stuff going on in the back, where, where we're making Jacob Hashimoto prints. Uh, Aurora McPhee and Lola Wegman have been nice enough to come in today and do a demonstration for us. And I also want to thank Keith, who's behind the camera here. Our monopole broke right before this happened, so yeah. we're doing it handheld. But um, anyway, with no further ado, I'll pass it over to JP, who will explain a little bit about this beautiful building that we live in. Hi, I'm Jean-Paul Russell, um, as Ann mentioned from Durham Press. Um, a brief history, history about the building. It was an old schoolhouse built in the 80s grant from Cooper and Hewitt, who owned a local mine here for $2,000. It was a two-room schoolhouse with a later addition in the back built in 1927. It was another 5,000 square feet with two more classrooms. We, it was taken out, it was an elementary school until 1980. Started uh, with Hank in 1988 uh, at the beginning of Durham Press. And with that, we'll take you inside. I did want to point out all has all been restored recently. Um, JP figured all this out and it's, it's just this beautiful entrance way. This used to be the original door here. It was the first two story schoolhouse, was it? It was the first two story schoolhouse in the neighborhood. And as you can see, if Keith is giving you a view, 
it's incredibly beautiful here and we're really, really lucky because a lot of it's in land preservation. So we can maintain our views. I wanna just start real quickly with this uh, recent etching by Michael Heiser. Michael was involved with Durham Press right from the beginning. Um, we worked together uh, when I worked at a different shop in New York City. And when I started Durham Press, he was willing to come out here and start working together. And this is just an example of one of the most recent uh, prints we made, which is this large drive point made with a very large cut. It's, it's loosely, you know, it's pretty much based on Drag Mask, which was an exhibition he did at the Detroit Institute of the Arts in the early 70s. Hi. I'll take over here. So I just, to give you a sense of what room we're in, um, normally this room operates as our shipping room. So we usually have a big table here. We have a kitchen as Keith maybe can pan around and show you. This is where we feed the artists, where the staff prepare their lunches. Um, the artists, when they're working here, mostly come and stay here. We'll show you the guest room as well. But I figured I'd start today off with one of the, a recent project, but a phenomenal project that we just got back from the downtown Art Museum where we had a beautiful show. Um, this is a project, project by Chitra Ganesh and it's called Sultana's Dream. It's 27 lino cuts. And I, from listening to all the different publishers that came ahead of us, it's been really helpful <laughs> to know what to talk about. But one of the things I thought maybe I would try to cover more as I went around to the different artworks was to talk about a little, little bit more about how the projects came to be and how the relationship came to be. So starting with Chitra, I would say Chitra, I saw her work at a collector's home. Uh, I was completely intrigued by it. And I decided to approach her and see if she was interested in making prints with us. We started with one project, um, Architects of the Future, which is really beautiful. And while she was working on that, she told us about her interest in creating this, uh, or recreating the story of Sultana's Dream, which is actually a pretty famous story that was written in 1905 by Rokea uh, Sakawat Hossein. And as Chitra is growing up, uh, relating to this story, it's kind of a feminist cult classic. Um, she really, really wanted to bring the story to life. And we decided to, you know, try to figure out a way to do that with her because we thought it was completely intriguing as well. So at the time we were working with, um, working in the studio was Jesse Shaw, who's the lino cut printer and we, take her drawings because she works mostly with, um, she works mostly drawing in her computer, by computer. And we took her drawings and we screen printed them onto the linoleum. And then Jesse made the cuts and they discussed it a lot together, how to collaborate. And it was really a collaboration. Like these lines are obviously very important in the artwork. And there's something that she and Jesse developed together. Um, I want to actually tell you also a little bit about what the story is. If maybe I can ask you to move back a bit to give the overview. So, and here, we'll start from here. So it's a super amazing story. And in this moment that we're living in, it's something we want to think about more. It's a form that she falls asleep and she wakes up and there's a beautiful goddess luring her out into the streets. She remembers what the world was like in this one here. And then when she actually gets outside, she realizes the world is completely changed. And she asks the goddess who had lured her into the streets, why is it so beautiful and so clean and and where are all the men and then the goddess goes on to explain that the the men in their warring ways had managed to kill one another off and the women had taken over and they now ran the society and they put um, horticulture and compassion at the forefront of their mission 
They, in 1903, when it was written, she was already 14. She talked about how they envisioned ways to cook without pollution, how women in their ingenuity would figure out ways to capture the moisture from the sky and pump it down in hot air balloons. She talks about flying cars. Um, and she also talks about how the men had to be kept safe in a zanana. <laughs> so this is where the men live in Ladyland. Uh, kind of a flip on the handmaid's tale, but with women in charge, I'm proud to say we placed it as to many museums. Um, it comes in a beautiful portfolio box and it took us over three years back and forth with Chitra to just go through the whole process of putting the whole thing together. A lot of back and forth, a lot of discussion. Um, Jesse was an amazing part of it. And if you want to look him up, he's, he's actually on his own now. He's an American printmaker, does beautiful work. And we had a question. Um, do you know who, who wrote yes. Sultan's Dream? Do you know? Rokea Hossein. Oh no, Rokea Sakawat Hossein. Thank you. She was, she was a Bengali, um, she was a wealthy Bengali woman, really, and an activist who was who was trying to push for women to be educated. And it was kind of just to make a point that, you know, if women were in charge or we're losing all this ingenuity of women, if we if we put them in charge, this is what might happen. And it was published in India Ladies Journal in 1905. Um, to doing more projects with Chitra. Chitra is actually now doing a, um, has a show at Leslie Lohman in New York Museum. Leslie Lohman Museum is in the windows. Uh, it's really wonderful. So I would over to Holly, Holly Applebaum <laughs> for 20 some years and um, I think one of the things that distinguishes or, or, or is specific to us is that we tend to work with the same artists over and over and over. And we really put a huge emphasis on experimentation. And uh, Polly has, we've developed so many different processes just to figure out how to work best with Polly's creative process. And things like this is something you can only do with someone that you really have trust in their, you know, capabilities, mutual trust. And every single one of these colors in here and every single one of these shapes is an individual wood block. And Polly does these all live. Um, these are monoprints and she comes to the studio and we have as many as six to 10 people inking blocks for her and both studios are taken over. And she just creates these on the spot in the studio and, um, this was during a time period, sort of the culmination of works that she was doing, the atomics that came out of her interests um, in mosaic and stained glass from her trip to Rome after she won the Rome Prize. Um, but these are just bursting with joy and uh, power. Um, really, really beautiful prints. Uh, so we'll talk more about Polly because there'll be more Polly in our tour. Really exciting new prints, which have by Leslie Wayne on this wall. Uh, Leslie Wayne has worked with us also for many years. We did a project with her many years ago and then kind of let it sit for a bit. And recently, a few years ago, I saw her show at Jack Shaman where she had made these constructions out of paint of these windows. And um, it's really kind of interesting looking at these now after COVID and everything that's going on, they're even more powerful and poignant. Uh, they're a combination of screen print, wood block, um, and actually all this is, is like hand, hand done and mixed the beautiful detail in those. We have another incredible piece of hers upstairs too, which I'm excited to show you. We launched it at the Armory this year, right before we had to shut down. Um, 
but it's an incredible piece upstairs. But these are speaking to me right now. Um, I'll have to take you over here. So you might have seen these on our in our art fair page. These are Polly's monoprints, which is the continuation of her theme of targets. Polly loves to use symbols. Um, the word target can mean so many different things. Uh, there was a beautiful quote somebody made about it that it's the, the joy of all the different colors and, and sort of the union, but it's also reminding us that there's also target a, a, a potential there's some potential sort of ominous quality to all of it um I, we first saw the targets with a poster that we did with her and it was a me too poster where we right at the beginning of me too we made and raised money for some different causes but Polly the beginning. I, I have seen it in so many different forms with flowers or um, now she's been doing it with ceramics and they came out of a show that she did at the Icon Museum in Birmingham and then traveled to the Kemper Museum. She made rugs with the targets. Um, I love them. We all love the targets. Uh, anyway, these are just the monoprints. So these were just very small ones. So each one of these is unique. The, the center always stays the same and the background colors changed. And as we now we'll move up to the next phase where you're gonna see one of the very large targets and we're gonna to move to the upstairs galleries. We'll go. So here's Polly's target. And I also wanna say quickly that this is all the original staircase from the school. It's really beautiful. Um, it's one of my favorite places. And we have Polly's tremendous five foot square target. And maybe you'll see when we get back to the studio, uh, the hydraulic press that that was made on. And each one of those rings is an individual um, assembled together. And uh, you'll get a sense of what that takes to do that when we get into the studios. Um, it's a little echoey in here, I hope it's okay. Uh, here we have Roland Fisher, another artist who's worked with us for many, many years and a good friend. He's in Munich, Germany. He's a photographer. And these are all woodblock prints, but they have been, they have been cut and, and designed from photographs he took of interiors of buildings. And um, I think they're incredibly beautiful. And if you look at sort of some subtlety, you start to realize where the actual shapes of the building come into play. I am blanking on the building right now. <laughs> the many of them came from. Here we are in the big this original Victorian schoolhouse. We have these incredible windows. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that this building has been our home. <laughs> it's had many different walls put in and out. And even just as it is, this room converts to a studio for an artist while they're visiting here. So we can pull out a million tables and, and turn it into somebody's studio, or we use it as a gallery to have events and host people to come see the work. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, I wanted to show you first. You can see there's a lot of beautiful things here. Uh, I actually will mention the table before I go to Leslie because we do encourage people to come visit us and there is another beautiful thing to do out nearby us which is to visit the Nakashima Studios. This is a George Nakashima table and a chair that JP designed behind it. Um, and anyway, it's another fun thing you can do if you decide to come out and visit. We are happy to organize, um, organize sort of a day trip for you if you're interested in coming. So here is another one of Leslie's pieces, and this is something altogether 
different for us. JP not only is an incredible printmaker, but he's also an incredible carpenter and just a maker. And when he and Leslie started to discuss ideas, it, it became an interest to him to actually create something physical. And this doesn't have a lot of printmaking in it. Um, it's, it's generally just a construction. So I'm gonna open it for you. At this point, I'm going to let JP dis describe to you each of the elements in this, this beautiful piece. So one of the things that um, we talked, I talked about with Leslie, because she had been making these large cabinets, which were somewhat uh, representational and dimensional. And most of the wood she was representing through her paint. And if you know Leslie's work, both old and new, paint is a huge part of her process, the physicality of it, the thickness of it. And so, and then she was starting to actually work with illusion, flatness, space, actual construction. And when we first talked about doing something, she was saying, well, how will we get the wood grain? Will we silk screen it? And I said, well, you're sort of representing the wood in this alternative way. Why don't we actually just use wood for the wood parts? And so that's where we came up with the idea of actually making a cabinet kind of slightly dimensional. The thing's about two inches thick, so it's not, it's not as if it's a very deep closet. Um, it's loosely based on what would be her art storage or her archives, you know, represented here, her paint boxes, her radio, you know, kind of dated radio, and then CDs and paint, paint existing in the cabinet as it would have in maybe some of her earlier work, just paint as paint, um, as abstraction. And then there's a, a light use of digital for a kind of, you know, night sky. And again, a reference to the broken glass that you're seeing from the window so that the cabinet has no back and, and going out into space. Um, JP, we had a couple of people are um, wondering if it is it flat. They're, we're trying to wrap our heads around the dimensionality of that. So the, door, the doors, if you can see with Keith shooting right there are really representative of what a, a kitchen cabinet door would be like about three quarters of an inch thick. And the what they're mounted to is about an inch and a quarter thick. So there's very little depth in here, but we're playing with it with these kind of beveled angles, which is the illusion of the cabinets insides going back and the drawer front slightly out front here with the, with the paint sort of spilling out coming from nowhere as it could have come from the boxes, it could have come from some previous act or what's in the drawer. And then this towel um, or fabric coming out of the drawer represented just by a piece of thin plywood that's been painted. And then up here, you can see also a draped kind of rug or a rag or towel that's made of wood and then painted with the illusion of being dimensional. So it's, it's a little bit of a play. And here you have kind of a faked out thing, but here you have the actual paint draped over the bar in the closet. So it's just playing as much as one can with this limited depth. So. so on this wall, we have three very early Beatrice Miliasis prints. This one is actually the first project we did together in 1996. And the reason I put these up for this tour because we started this in 1996 and at the same time worked on about seven sheets of paper and we proofed them all much in the way that I was, that we worked when I worked in New York City, working for Rupert Smith, making Andy Warhol's work. And so we started, started off on that exploration and we, we only had known each other for about seven days and we had very little ability to communicate because she's from Brazil and I don't speak Portuguese. Um, so we sort of started with that. And then we started to focus on this print and develop this sort of very elegant, large scale print, which she did absolutely from scratch here at Durham Press. Even though she had brought materials, we didn't end up using any of them. She came back at a later date and we did what's what Wild Break, which was started during the first print, but then she added new motifs, worked with the ink a little differently, a little bit more opacity, a little bit more density, and the composition started to develop and become more complex. And what I love in this print is that her use of this large arabesque that is on the base of all the prints is accentuated here in blue with the circle in blue and then this kind of custom 
part of this print that she did, which creates an entire motif. And if you notice, if you get this painting, she's often linking up what could be a very large scale drawing, but with parts, instead of a, you know, an actual connected thing, like a final matrix of a standard print, what you have is this play with the eye where it's this one drawing, but it's really made up of parts. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really something. And then in the third print, which was being worked on during the first print and then the second print really could have been finished at multiple different times, um, but really wasn't achieving anything new. And so Beatrice had this idea to simply opaque the entire background and everything we had done to the print, almost getting it to collapse in on itself. So the print and the structure of the image came out from the center instead of being spread out all over. And then at that point, she did this metallic blue drawing, which kind of tightens and wraps it all back together. And then of course, this five or six color gray flower on top. And with that, you can see a print that she did in, in uh, 2016, which is 60 by 80 inches, which is woodblock, and I think roughly 60 layers of silkscreen, which is really just, again, from scratch, coming here with nothing, and over the course of 10 days with four or five people, working out every single aspect of this, all the colors, the density, the opacity. And, um, you know, one thing that we do a lot here is, uh, it, it's one thing to say something is 30 colors, but it actually might take 50 impressions to make that happen. So in this striped motif, for instance, is a nine color motif, which exists all the way across the top of this print, but has, every color has to be printed twice in order to get the density and the opacity to come out, which is something Beatrice is uh, really good at working with, working with sort of transparent feeling colors and um, that kind of thing. And then on to, this print which is by Micheline Thomas, which was her second project here, you know, really just shows you, it's like a printmaking tour of course. Um, the detail, it has silk screen on the paper, it has woodblock on the main case sheet of paper, and then it has silk screen on parts which are collaged on, woodblock parts that are collaged on, digital parts that are collaged on, um, actual wood veneer, and then, Represented, represented by woodblock printing wood veneer. And so Micheline is just taking um, the work to a whole other level of complexity and kind of a chaotic perfection, which is really quite remarkable. And last before we go to Abel Lucas, um, is just four etchings again by Michael Heiser, shaped plate etchings, um, which is a project we did in 2016. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Amo Lucas, who we've been working together since 2002 and have done a bunch of various uh, projects. Um, Amo has been an important part of Durham Press and what we've done here and, and kind of the new nuance and techniques that we've worked in to what we do. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the press. It's an amazing and exciting place. I was thinking about it today when I came in. Quite often I pull into the parking lot when I'm either proofing or um, working on um, monotypes. That's what we have here. Is like, what am I gonna learn today? You know, what, what is gonna happen? Something has to happen and what's gonna be the result of it. So, um, it, it's pretty safe to say that in my studios, I work with versatile materials, plaster, cement, water base, paints, paper, fiber. So traditional materials and untraditional materials, soot, things that decay, common fly larva. And it's also really safe to say that printmaking is a, is a process-based uh, medium, process-based endeavor. So in a way, my studios and the press have a unique relationship in that they align up but thankfully it's not a perfect alignment. There's, there's gaps in this alignment and those gaps are where there's, there's a real advantage to learn things and leave the press, have an event here that's worthwhile and, and we accomplish something, but leave the press 
and bring those findings to my, my practice. So some of those examples are when, when I'm working in my studio on thread painting, I can apply one thread at a time. I have about, I have a finite amount of color. I have about 800 spools of color of different threads and I can put one down at a time. So the painting evolves over a very slow process. I can see the effect of one thread, but to put a thousand or 5,000 threads down might take all day, two days. That's completely different from working here. Um, we, we print, uh, we produce silk screens and those silk screens can have five threads on them or 5,000 threads. They can be printed in transparent colors. We can swap colors in a matter of minutes and we can see the effect on a piece of paper. So that, that almost speeds up my vision of what can happen in the studio based on what comes off the press here. And um, that's incredibly informative. With the bubble paintings, um, pretty safe to say that all the bubble paintings that I make in my studio, they're a cast on plaster. It's, an, it's a negative cast of bubble wrap and I'm adding paint one bubble at a time. Here, um, the press has developed a way of working on those where we, we've made this, this amazing plate, which simultaneously can take one bubble and have ink applied to it, or I could take a broad gesture and a swipe and apply ink to hundreds of bubbles at one time and then alter them. Instead of the work being cast in plaster, it's embossed in the paper. So the, the speed ramps up so fast, but yet it's still the same process of affecting one bubble and building language out of this, this structure. The puddle paintings, I'm devising this apparatus in a puddle painting. And I'm fairly locked to it. I'm using gravity, particle size, and the history of, of the layers of, of, the, of the ink or the sumi ink or the watercolor. But then I'm locked to that structure. With, with the printmaking process, we can lift that structure off the plastic and, and embed it into a piece of paper and uh, kind, kind of create something completely different that I can't create at home. So we can talk about process for a long time. Um, what, what I find the most interesting is, is the process of what's happening as we see something, as either the artist wanting to accomplish something or cause an event, or what's happening as the viewer looks at the work, takes it apart, tries to understand it, and puts it back together. And that process isn't with material. It's with the brain and it's with the eye. And that, that far surpasses the other processes. So in trying to accomplish that, um, these prints are really subtle. And my wish is that they call you to look at them really careful and open your eyes and, and find the subtleties, find the physicalities, get on the other side of the glass, take them apart, put them back together and, and I hope that happens because from across the room, you might look at a print and say, I think it's doming outward. Why is it doming outward? And then when you get close to it, you find something completely different. Or you could look at a series and say, why did they stick glass to paper? And at the end, you find that's a very thin layer of film that's been lifted off the aluminum plate. So with that, um, I'm actually gonna turn it back over to Ian and JP. And um, I'm, I'm excited for some of the processes downstairs because the studios are, they're always changing. They're always adapting to the next artist coming in. And, um, and they're really beautiful. And it's really exciting to see, you know, as I'm talking about like, as you take something apart, put it back together, it's really exciting to see how it got there, to see the mechanisms that actually embossed it into the paper and, and to see the infinity of color that they have with all of the inks on the wall and the transparencies that can be added to it. And I think you even get to see some things in process um, 
with an expert staff that's working here that's just, uh, you know, fulfills whatever that we need to accomplish. So thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest of your tour. Thank yeah. you, Amos. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much. And I know everybody's excited. I realize that we're getting a little behind because I know everybody's excited to see the studios. So we'll go there. Thanks again, Amy. All right, I'm gonna take you back down through the hall. This is where sometimes our bear with us, it'll probably come right back. I should say our white one. Um, and on we come through the studios, and I'll pass you back to JP, Master Printer. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of both studios and a little demonstration, assuming we have enough time. Okay. All right, JP. So here we're in the woodblock and etching room, and I wanted to go over this uh, Jacob Hashimoto project that we've been working on since last summer. Jacob came here uh, for about a week, and we proofed these eight, these are eight of, but there's actually 12 prints. Um, before Jacob came, he had sent about a hundred kite designs, which all break down to an average of about four colors each. So we had to prepare about 400 blocks. Um, as you can see on this table, all of these blocks and these hand cut shapes that Jacob made all represent this print, go into making this print. So it gives you a sense of, of that. Went upside down get printed, get taken out. This is all one design. Go in and get printed and get taken out. And he's working on multiple kites with multiple windows, at least as many that'll fit on the page at once. And then he builds up compositions in which he then does other things to the work. In this project, he actually started with these hand cut shapes, which together form all of this, what we call our kind of more organic and, uh, shapes. And then he, filled it in with the kites. So on this print, unlike previous ones, you have more of a balance between the kites and the shapes and sort of a, you know, integrated. And then the final stage on this work has been, uh, he, we then photographed it. He had to put it in an iPad and digitally drew these lines, which are abstract kind of representations of the thread that you might see in his uh, primary work. With that, I'll take you to or we're going to demonstrate part of the print process of the print in the frame you were just looking at. Yeah, so as we finish printing, we'd like to walk you through the production process for one of Jacob Hashimoto's prints. This particular print that JP just showed you in the frame has about 18 colors and 37 blocks in total, which are split between four different panels. Um, some of the more complicated prints you pan to on the wall contained about 28 colors and over 70 blocks. Um, individual kites could also require seven blocks to print one complete pattern. We have already printed the first two panels of this print and we're about halfway through the print. So as I remove the panel, you'll be able to see that there have been nine colors printed and about 18 blocks. You also have a better view of the chase that we use to register the panel as well as the paper. And now we'd like to demonstrate printing the remaining woodblock portion of the print. Jenny, could you switch to the other camera, please? So as you can see, the new panel allows us to overlap existing kites that have been printed in previous panels. The frames are the first impression of every kite. They are in mahogany veneered MDF. So what we've done is place the frames face down. Um, due to the complex registration of each print, the blocks are printed face down. And the triple thick COZO replaces the blanket that you would typically see when printing on an etching press. 
Each layer of blocks is covered with masonite while running them through the press to protect the blocks from the repeated stress of production. And this wooden rail ensures that the press stays engaged and rolling even when it's not directly over a block. So we will now replace the frames with solid blocks and one of the padding blocks. We typically print in order of lightest to darkest colors. And as you can see by these registration panels here, the CNC has been a great tool for us, not only for cutting the individual kite designs, but for registering the, block, the blocks. During the cutting process, Jake Hashimoto placed and place individual registration windows to position the many layers that correspond to one type design. So now that we're in production, these panels allow us to print multiple kites simultaneously while matching the replacement to the original proofs. We've labeled the blocks with registration corners and numbers that correspond to their position on the panel. Now we will complete the color type design by printing its final block with this many layers of overlapping ink. We needed to select a paper that was very absorbent. So in this edition, we've used a 430 gram Poso that was handmade in Japan specifically for this project. Rolling the press backwards because we will be printing this layer in the same direction as the last. All blocks have the same registration window, so it's important that we put the most solid block against a solid surface of the registration panel. Herrera, we have a bunch of questions about the process. Um, yeah, go ahead. Wondering, is the paper cushioned in the chase? The paper is not cushioned, but it is a triple thick pozo. And so it does act as the blanket in that way. Um, someone else is wondering if you ever need to mix soaked and unsoaked paper runs in one print, um, depending on the plate type. Um, for this, we're printing dry, but some wood blocks that we've done in the past, we lightly missed the surface of the block of the paper. Um, in order to maximize the embossment, but we find that this paper does just fine without that extra encouragement. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So as you can see, these are a little bit difficult to place. We want to make sure that they go down in the same placement each time so that we're able to reprint if anything needs a re-hit. And we also want to make sure that they don't shift in the printing process. For our viewers who haven't figured it out yet, of course, what you're seeing side by side is an overhead view of the press uh, along with the, the um, side by side view of it. So these blocks can also be difficult because of their larger surface area. So they do displace more pressure than the individual kites would. We can counter that by inking them with a little bit heavier of a layer of ink, as well as slightly manipulating the pressure by putting acetate on the backs of the blocks like needed. And Lil will show you the big reveal. So as JP mentioned before, or this print will receive additional layers of silkscreen that will be 
that have been digitally drawn by Jay Prakash Modo. And that completes the print. So as you guys can see here on the wall is a large 80 inch by 115 inch uh, earlier mono print that we did with Jacob, which literally has hundreds of kites in it, multiple colors, also on a handmade Japanese Kozo fiber paper. With that, if we have time, I can take you back into the screen room where we cut off last. Just to point out that is the hydraulic press too. Yeah, right here. The uh, aquatemp box on top, lack of space. <laughs> so I don't know where we left off, but this is a project that we're doing. Jamie Nares. This is uh, one of about eight acetates that he painted when he was here. He's using uh, oil paint and encaustic to make it transparent so that I'm able to do multiple exposures in a screen and then re compile the work back together to make the brushstroke uh, to try to make it seamless between the highlight and the shadow. So that space is what we're trying to fill. So on the press here, you can see the first exposure of that, which is a very light exposure, which holds very little information. So you can start off with the lightest color and print what looks a little bit more like a silhouette and then slowly have it close down screen by screen as the ink gets darker and darker and trying not to see those steps. On the wall, there's some of the other brush strokes, slightly larger ones that he did when he was here. It's painting on a, a pebbled mylar. It's actually a, a polycarbonate. It's what we use. It holds kind of a, a more articulation and more information. So we're, we're able to scale the film process, which really generates the work a little bit and gives it a different feeling. And so by here, we're still working, you know, one-to-one -one with the real work that Jamie made specifically for the prints without kind of copying anything. On the wall are some drawings that he did for a different project using these large cone, cones that we have that spin with paper on them while Jamie paints them. There's nine different, eight different cones and one cylinder creating all these different degrees of arcs. And from there, we can scan them, make photogravure plates. We could print film, shoot silk screens. So it kind of is a different departure point and a different way of working with him. Um, as you saw with, with uh, Aurora's and Lola's demonstration there on Jacob's, this is a, the, what you saw earlier with the polyalphabon target prints and a more typical setup where you're printing with the paper on top. Uh, there's a bunch of different rings that all go together, all inked, all put together with a colored background. And then we run it through with the blankets on top. Um, we've devised a little jig here because these prints, we want the ink to print straight off the decal. So it's saturated off the edge. So in order to place the paper, this aluminum panel hovers above this. And then as it goes in the press, it will pinch and then the, um, I can't actually do it for you, but as it goes in the press, it'll pinch here. This little device will hit these pins and this panel will stay still and allows the paper to feed in so that we don't have to hold it and you know, possibly twitch it and change the registration. Our latest unit um, we did last year, and this gives you a sense of not only the complexity of this uh, complexity of this woodblock part, which is about 150 blocks of various things. There's mostly maple for printing the flat colors, a little bit of oak and a little bit of mahogany. And then this really nice kind of engraved part of the wood, which we did upside down on a table saw, which kind of provides this raking light, this raking motif across the entire print. It's about 30 colors, this layer. So once that's down, we take it to the silk screen part and it gets about 50 layers of silk screen. Probably we have about 30 colors because lots of things are hit two and three times. Every color on the targets twice, the enamel parts printed three times. Some are just printed once. And then from there, we put down some glue for the gold leaf, which you have on the left and on the right. And then a detail down the middle, which was going to be a multicolored, uh, probably silkscreen motif here, 
that we decided to just do in watercolor. So Beatrice came up with what you could almost call like a painted RTP. And then uh, Aurora and another studio assistant had to kind of follow what she did. The, the blue drawing is actually from an Indian wood block. So the pattern, and then it was just really about filling in the color. So it really gives you a, a sense of the complexity. It's, you know, months and months worth of work. Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, Jenny, do you want to the wood shop? Uh, actually, we had a question um, for JP. Okay. Um, wondering how do the artists prepare these complicated multi block prints? Um, did Polly start with a collage, a painting, a drawing to size? Well, actually, with most of the artists here, I, I can say all with, and with every project, and it does vary. Um, there's very little stuff coming in. Um, with Polly, we discuss shapes. So when she's working on the diamond shapes, we come up with the size, and then we start producing tons of, of that kind of motif or module and make hundreds of them. But the designs that go into them, we often cut while she's here. And the colors are often decided when she's here. Um, with somebody like Jacob, as I was saying, it, it would be impossible. We, it's almost two weeks worth of preparation to make 400 blocks for him. So we have to have all that done ahead of time. But that, of course, has nothing to do with the composition and the building of the print and what he's actually going to do, what colors he's going to use. That's all done on arrival. In the case of this Beatrice Miliazzi's print, there were there was a drawing. There were actually two drawings because this project started off as two prints. There was really this print and this print, and we were well into proofing. Um, I had pre-made the blocks, and you're we well into proofing the two prints. And serendipitously, two of the prints were together, two of the proofs were together kind of close on the wall. And somebody from the front office sort of said, oh, I didn't know you guys were making a big print. And we said, we're not making a big print. And then we looked at it and then we were making a big print. So even preparing everything and being kind of ahead of it, you know, three, four days into a print, we had to completely reverse, make a new J that housed the larger blocks, get the thing to fit together so that it worked together better for Beatrice. So. Most of it is really done here. Sometimes there's drawings, um, sometimes, most of the time there's not. Um, in the case of somebody like Jamie Nares, it's a very different process. You're painting one image, so, and then you're trying to dissect that into multiple layers, and that's done here, and then he comes out, and then there's the whole color part. You have to decide on the color and the density, and are we gonna go from light to not so dark? Are we gonna start darker and end up darker, or are we gonna do a a very subtle range, um, all which you can do with the same image once you have the screens. That's perfect. We, we can take a few more minutes if you want to go into the next room since we did lose you for a bit. Sure, we can try to see the uh, wood shop, which is kind of integral to what you're seeing made in here. So what we have here is, is really the studio below the studio we were studios we were just in. And um, it's, it's technically a basement, but it's mostly uh, out of ground and has a reasonably high ceiling. So down here, we put kind of your standard wood shop. We have a metal area over there where he's pointing the camera, where we can weld and do some basic construction like that. We also have a spray booth in the back corner or painting on uh, conversion varnish on the blocks or doing whatever finishes we need to do. Um, hidden around here is a large uh, CNC where we do all the cutting on the blocks when we're using it, but we also like in the case of poly, still cut by hand and use the table saw to make the components. Um, so it's it's been a, a, an amazing addition and especially as the block has become a stronger element of therm press. And then the rest is just your, you know, your standard things to be able to fabricate um, things that we need to make the prints. Um, and these, which are hard to understand, I mentioned the, the drawings, the other drawings of Jamie Nairs upstairs that were done on these the graphs. These are, this is the 75 degree, and of course the flat side is the 90 degree cone, which the paper gets taped to. They spin on a motor like this, and then Jamie has devised a paintbrush 
with an ink bottle on the end that's able to continuously feed the brush and paint the lines that you're seeing upstairs at high speed. So they're called high speed cone graphs. And then behind you, you have like 45 degree cone. So you have this whole group of cones which go down to a cylinder. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, we, there are always questions about um, how you find artists to work with and how that relationship um, develops between you and, and new artists that you might be considering. Well, I think as Ann mentioned, uh, the relationships we have, the artists, are, they, they go a long way. And I, and I think you can kind of see with the complexity of these prints, you need that sort of time to develop. Um, some artists who can handle large, large amounts of information and working with large groups of printers in a very open environment are able to take advantage of that very quickly. And others, it takes more time to kind of build up their knowledge, not only of printmaking, but working with people and coming up with, you know, new ideas and new ways to work that might be similar to their studio, but not exactly what they're doing. Um, I'm always trying to encourage that, you know, um, you're in a print shop, so you want to do print things, whether that is something like Chitra's Project, which is more of a publication oriented, you know, narrative driven project or something like Polly's where you just start developing, you know, massive amounts of wood blocks and it's just there for the taking. We create what we create, we pick a size and we make what we make and often working on multiple different ideas at the same time. Some of the targets have come out of proofing while we're literally doing the pinwheels and the geometric, the other geometric work. That's perfect. Thank you. I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, thank you, JP. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Keith. We actually had compliments, Keith, for your excellent camera work. Um, yes, oh, Anne. We... So yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.